That way we can get a prayer on here. Okay, if you'd lead us, please. Father God, we thank you uh, once again for this beautiful day that you've given us to come into your house and uh -huh. worship you, to praise you, to love you, to love each other, to learn more about you. Father, we, we heard our prayer requests this morning, uh, and, and there's many more that uh, maybe didn't get mentioned, but uh, Lord, we just know that you're in control and that you're fully capable of, of handling in every situation. So we just we just put them in your hands, ask that you would provide comfort and healing, uh, and that most of all your presence would be felt and your love would be felt in every situation. To be with Mike as he brings us a lesson this morning, and give him the words and the thoughts that you would have him to share with us this morning and open our hearts and our minds so that we can apply your word to our hearts and to our lives. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> well, we're going to start a brand new book, the book of Ecclesiastes. So, what do we know about Ecclesiastes? Solomon wrote it. Who? Solomon. Yeah, he's a pretty smart guy, wasn't he? <laughs> okay, Solomon wrote, what does Ecclesiastes mean? Preacher, I think. How's fight? <laughs> <laughs> he's already saying up here. Okay. You ever heard of the word ecclesia? Okay, ecclesia is basically the body. Ecclesiastes is a noun, which could be the preacher or teacher, <clears throat> but it's a person. It's an individual, basically, is what it is. Part of the ecclesia. Well, Solomon, what else do we know about Solomon? King of Israel. What'd you say? Gave him more wisdom than anybody else. There you go. He was a real smart guy. He had great, great wisdom. What else did he have? Wealth. wealth. Yes, he had wealth. He had basically everything at his disposal. <clears throat> now, as we start getting into the book of Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> we're going to see some things about what his goals are in life. And he's in a position better than anyone else to attain those goals or to research those goals. Now, what is one of the things that the book of Ecclesiastes, a concept that it just starts right off the bat with? Everything is vanity. <clears throat> what does the word vanity mean? Disappears. Disappears. It's fleeting. It's a vapor. It, it's, it's a negative concept that it's just not worth much. And uh, he starts off the book with everything's vanity and basically ends the book with everything's vanity. So he said, well, why would you want to study something depressing like that? Well, there's a good reason for that. Because there's a remedy for that vanityness. Is that a word? Vanityness? There's a remedy for that. Now, Solomon, with all of his wisdom, was before who? Christ. Now, with what he had, he was very, very intelligent. He was smart. He had a lot of wisdom that God gave him. And as he looked at things, he brought him into perspective, which is just another point of the Old Testament pointing us towards Christ. And I just, I just, I love studying the Old Testament because it's constantly, everywhere you look, it's pointing towards Jesus. And we have that here in Ecclesiastes. So, if you will, let's take a look at the printed text. And I've written it down up here because it kind of jumps around a little bit. But it, does anybody not have a book that would like one? Chip? Here you go, sir. Lesson number eight. <clears throat> All right. They entitled this study today, What's the Use? You know, <laughs> you know sometimes we all say that, well, what's the use? It's too hard. It's too cumbersome. I just can't get it. So what's the use? You know, let's don't give up. That's the whole theme. And I, you know, if, if you want it bad enough, work through it. Just keep going. All right. So let's look at ver uh, chapter one, beginning at verse 12. I, the preacher or teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. 
I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. How depressing are we starting off here? <laughs> Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what hath man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief, Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy but the but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before god this also is vanity and vexation of spirit well i say let's just quit go home and just get over this mess it's just terrible <laughs> but you know what as we go through this and we look at what he's uncovered through his analogies his studying and everything else it points us to that's not where we have to be. We have a better hope. We have a faith and we have a confidence in a life that's much better to come. Now, <clears throat> Solomon had limited information because of the time where he lived. He had great wisdom that God gave him and God gave him the ability to analyze, to study, to look at things. And he made some very, very great conclusions of his study. But it says here that I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out my wisdom concerning all the things that are done under heaven. So he, in his mind, decided he's going to search out the meaning of life. Now, he had everything at his disposal. He looked at nature, and he studied nature, he looked at pleasure and indulged in pleasure. He looked at acquiring wealth and indulged in that. And all these things that he studied and, and, and sought after and learned about, he came to the conclusion they don't satisfy. He said, you know, I can go out here and work hard all my life and make all kinds of money and amass all this fortune. And then I die just like everybody else. Can't take it with you. Can't take it with you. Wes? I wish I'd have studied Ecclesiastes before I got married. <laughs> Are you going to elaborate on that or just leave it there? Well, we felt How like, much trouble do you want to get yourself uh, in? <laughs> when we got married, we felt like we had to have all this stuff. Yeah. Like everybody else. Yeah, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, he did better than I could have done. <laughs> Solomon, you know, realized that we can work all of our life making money and therefore not have a life. And you can't take it with you. We've seen people have tried to take it with them as they've unearthed some tombs and, and things in, in Egypt and stuff. And they see where the, the kings and things would have all these possessions put in with them. They're still in the tomb, aren't they? It didn't go anywhere. I heard a, a funny story one time about a man that had amassed a great wealth and he had a lot of gold. And, 
and he wanted to be able to just take one of his gold ingots with him when he died. And Okay. You know, he gets to heaven, you know, and he's got that gold ingot. And God says, what are you doing with that paving stone? <laughs> I thought it was cute. <laughs> well, anyway, we can't take it with us. Whatever we do here, we leave to somebody else. Now, He's tip. buried in that Cadillac, can't you? Well, I've heard stories about stuff like that or sitting on a motorcycle or different things. But, you know, we have things in our laws today where we set up wills and trusts and all this stuff to leave it to where we want it to go. Solomon's going, you know, somebody could get it that I have no control over. And that's true. You know, because once somebody dies and you go and uh, let's say it comes out of a family that's kind of greedy, then all the wars start. And I'll tell you, it's, it can really, really get ugly. And you think you've got everything laid out the way you want it, but man, when that starts. So, as we go through this lesson, we're going to come down to the last part of it. And it's going to give us an indication of what we should do. So let's go back and start looking again here and see what Psalm has to say. You know, I, the preacher, the king over Israel in Jerusalem, I gave my heart to seek and to search out my wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and behold all the vanity and vexation of spirit. He says, I've seen it all. And here's his conclusion. That which is crooked cannot be made straight and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. In other words, we can't understand why certain things happen. Solomon looked at it that way. We can look at it that way today. We can't figure things out. We can't make sense of the injustices in the world. You know, we, we can't fix things. We can strive to try to, but there's a lot of evil in this world. Men's hearts are full of evil, and we have to do battle to offset that. But Solomon said, you know, things that are crooked, we can't make them straight, and there's just too many injustices that we can't resolve why that's happening. You know, we think that knowledge is power. You ever heard that term? So if knowledge is power, you gain power, which will enable you to gain more knowledge, then more knowledge gives you even more power. Well, I think Solomon's saying with the more knowledge, and, and knowledge is better than foolishness. Let me make sure we state that. But with a lot of knowledge, sometimes it opens our eyes to see things that we don't want to see we start seeing some really ugly stuff, some injustices, more injustices, more of suffering of humanity. So the more knowledge we gain, it can be a bad thing. And it's just like with most things I think in the world, there's good and bad to both sides, You're like the internet. The internet's a wonderful thing, but it's also a very nasty thing too. So it depends on how you use it and what you do with it. And I think this is where Solomon's kind of coming to the conclusion is that, you know, at the end, what are you going to do with everything that you've got? You're going to leave it. So, from the teacher's perspective, under the sun, after all that he had experienced, learned, and done, he declared that it was basically a vanity. And I want to give you what, you know, the Hebrew word translated vanity means vapor or breath. And it's from a word that comes to mean temporary or fleeting, inconsequential, or even absurd. So basically, if we look at what he's saying, he's saying some of the things that we go after and chase after is just so fleeting that it's just absurd to even think about doing that. But yet, what does society tell us? Grab all you can. He who has the most wins. Well, then why do they, all these rich and famous people commit suicide. I'm not saying that other people don't as well, but you'd think if you had all the money, if this worldly philosophy was right, why would you ever want to kill yourself? Or why did they turn to drugs and all that? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Mike? And even if they don't, I actually thought about this this week, not really thinking about the lesson necessarily, but when Jeff, Jeff Bezos went into space, I was thinking, you know, this guy's got enough money $28 million, not, not to mention all the developmental money that went into it, but just that trip, 20 seconds in space, 
for $28 million and was just thrilled and happy. Good for him. That doesn't make him a bad person. Right. Or anything. But, and I, and I know nothing about his situation with the Lord at all, but if Jeff Bezos or, or Bill Gates or anybody like that, if they die without Jesus, they're going to spend eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any difference. And I think that's what it's, it's sort of talking about. You have to put it, you know, having money, having wealth, having power, having any of it in and of itself is not evil. It's right. not bad. Right. You just have to keep it in perspective. It's not permanent. It's not, it's not going to last. It's, right. It's for a while. And then what really matters is your relationship with the Lord and where you're going to spend eternity. That's all that really matters. Exactly. It, I don't know, I guess maybe that he gave that 82-year-old uh, lady a free trip there, which I thought that was pretty cool because yeah. she was one of the early astronaut candidates. And yeah, I thought... Good. I thought that was really cool, but I don't know a lot about him either. I've heard a lot of negative stuff, but you heard what Tulsi Gabbard said about that, didn't you? The only bad thing about that flight with Bezos on is that it came back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know what you think about Tulsi, but I think she is a pretty sharp lady. I, I enjoyed some of the things that she said during the bait. She was, she was pretty cool, but... Anyway, so he's saying that all is vanity. That's my conclusion. It's just all is vanity. And then we said, that which is crooked cannot, cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. All the wisdom in the world cannot fix the deepest problems of humanity. We are a flawed group of people. Now, where do we trace that back to? Yeah. Adam and Eve. Who was who was more at fault in the garden? You ever thought about that? Which one was the uh, greatest sinner, Adam or Eve? Well, no, I kind of tend I tend to kind of agree with her because Adam was there with her. He didn't try to stop it, did he? Oh, okay. Let's see what happens to her. <laughs> oh, she didn't die. Well, let me try it. I, I don't really know how that went down. They're both culpable. They both succumbed to sin. Before you jump on them and start criticizing them, what would you have done? You know, you don't know unless you were there. But sin entered the world. Now, up until that point, which what was that, Genesis 3, when that happened to fall? Up to that point, what did Adam do? Tilled the garden, named the animal. So he had a job, right? Yep. Now, let's think about those jobs that he had. When he was tilling the garden, how did he get rid of the weeds? There were no weeds. No weeds. That's right. There was no weeds. So therefore, that was probably a pretty enjoyable job, right? But God initiated man to work. That was part of the original plan. <clears throat> And his work was pleasurable to do it. It gave him purpose. But he didn't have all the frustrations that we have now after the fall. Now you think about that. Work is something that we are supposed to do according to God's plan. And it's supposed to be enjoyable for us. It gives us fulfillment. It gives us purpose and pleasure. Dennis. Yeah, I uh, was watching a program with, uh, with uh, Reverend Billy Graham. And he was on uh, the late night show with Johnny Carson doing an interview. And Ed McMahon was there, his sidekick. And it was a very interesting program. One of the things Billy Graham said was, well, Ed, you know, we're all sinners. And Ed McMahon said, well, that's news to me. <laughs> yeah. So was making a joke. Right. You know? But the interesting thing that Billy Graham said in that program, and he says, you know, Johnny, when we get to heaven, we're going to have work to do. You know, and people don't always take that into an understanding. Right. We're, we're going to have real work to do for the Lord when we get to heaven. And I found that really interesting that he would say that. So we're not going to float around on clouds right. with harps? <laughs> But you know what? That work will be very pleasurable, fulfilling, and enjoyable. So the fall occurred 
and mess that up. Satan's job is to counterfeit everything God does, right? So if God's job was to have work be pleasurable, Satan was to make it toilsome. And that's why we have weeds in the garden. That's why you have to deal with employees. That's why you have to deal with customers, bosses, bosses co-workers, government. government. Death. <laughs> Death, yeah. But it was originally set up to be something that we enjoyed doing. So now keep that thought in mind as we go on down through here. It says, all the wisdom in the world cannot be fixed, uh, you know, with what's going on. It just can't be. Anything other than dependence on and trust in God is an attempt to grasp the unattainable, in other words, to chase after the wind. That was what his conclusion was. All right, now let's move over here a little bit more. So his quest was an attempt to find the meaning of life. Why would he even think of something like that? How about because God put that in his mind? He was, one, he was the wisest man in the world, correct? So if he's that wise, that wisdom came from God. So if a thought comes to him, that's very philosophical, whatever, it's probably from God, and God wanted him to do this, put it in the Bible to point towards Christ. That's what I think. That's the way I look at it. So Solomon did this, and he came to a lot of different conclusions, and it's very sad. But it says, as believers today, you and I, we understand that there is a wisdom that does not lead to despair. Solomon's wisdom led to despair, but we understand that wisdom does not lead to despair. The truly wise are those who know Jesus. Now, look at your life, your friends, your family maybe, whoever you know you work with or anything like that, and you've got saved individuals and you've got lost individuals. And you look at attitudes from the two. A lot of times, you know, it's just fatalism for un unsaved people. It's, 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 a, it's just sad if you can really get down to the heart of what they think. I've got a guy that was one of my best friends in college. We were fraternity brothers and just, you know, great. And, and he is just so negative on everything and so out there. Uh, you know, I love him to death, but, you know, he's, he's lost. And uh, he's just, the statements he makes and things, you can tell he's miserable with himself. And a lot of people... If you, even Christians are miserable. You know, we win, folks. We need to be the happiest people on this earth. We need to be joy all over our face so that people say, what makes you so happy? Well, let me tell you what makes me happy. We're not looking at things here to make us happy. We're looking at things there to make us happy. We have the book. We can read the end of the story. You know, Solomon didn't have what we have today. Jesus hadn't walked upon the earth. Jesus hadn't died for everybody's sin. Jesus hadn't shown us the way. We have that over him. You think how much wisdom he had. Okay, now look at what you've got. All right, let's move on down here to verses 18 through 21. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall die or that shall be after me. Well, now... <laughs> that gives you a little insight there. We have to kind of analyze what does he mean. Well, he comes down because he's afraid they're going to squander it. He'd worked hard at it. He'd strip, stri he strove very hard to make what he had and to do what he had to leave it to someone that could just go out and squander it. Well, hopefully today, you know, we have the courts and different things like that. We talked about that earlier to leave it, you know, to our family or something. I've got a, a guy that works with me that has no family, and you know, he's. He's a, an ex-Marine. He's going to leave a lot to the Marines and, and different uh, things like that. But he's also leaving a bunch to um, uh, ASPCA. That's the pet stuff. Well, I get that. You know, I hate seeing animals mistreated and stuff like that. But, you know, it's whatever you want to do with it, and you can make provisions for that. But what happens if that doesn't get dispersed the way you want? Well, you ain't going to know about it. <laughs> so why fret over it? 
To me, Solomon was a worry wart. And you know why? Because of much knowledge. Another point here he's trying to make. With great knowledge also comes great responsibility and comes great self-imposed problems. So you look at some of the books of the Bible, you wonder why that's in there. Because God's trying to teach us something. He's wanting to show us something. He's given us something to look at now, to analyze and say, yeah, I get that. And what's a remedy? Well, the remedy is Jesus. If you think about it, Jesus is basically the remedy to everything. You know? It's Jesus. So, and who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Well, you know, that's really interesting that that worried him because he'd amassed so much. It worried him who was going to end up with it and what they were going to do with it. Now, you, you take people that are very, very wealthy. We talked about that a while ago. A lot of them are miserable because they're trying to figure out how to keep people from getting their stuff. Have you ever noticed that? And sometimes they're the cheapest people around. They'll just nickel and dime you to death. And just, I know going out and calling in business and stuff, and, and you take somebody that come up and made all this money, and he's got more money and knows what to do with, and then he quibbles over a few dollars on something because they get in that mindset. That's how they build it. And they're spending their entire life making money. Well, the question is, is that a life? Something to pose. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise unto the sun. This is vanity. This is absurd to think like this. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took unto the sun. Mm -hmm. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This is also vanity. His point is we go through life striving to keep up with the Jones. Wes said it, set the stage perfectly. When you get married, you want to have the best you can. And I remember when Becky and I first got married, you know, we had a lot of friends that were buying these big houses they couldn't afford. And you'd end up seeing them end up in a divorce because they're fighting over money. And I told Becky, I said, look, we're going to do this the best we can, but we're not going to live above our means. We're going to live modestly, and we're not going to have issues over money. And and that's the way we always we did. You know, our first little house, 900 square feet, paid $14,900 for it. And we were just happy as clams. And I remember the day that I decided to get cable TV for us. It was $6.95 a month. And I just knew that was a lot of money. I know it. I know it, but I, I knew that was a lot of money. But I, I you know, I wanted because you, you couldn't really get anything hardly unless you had cable, and so you know that was a big step right there. But I waited till we could afford it, and I was always taught to save, to save something. It's way my dad always instilled, save something, and you know, but we just uh, we tried to make sure that we did what the Lord wants to do because we started out our marriage as Christians, which is wonderful. You've done that; that's great. But a lot of people don't. And that can cause some issues. And these are things that I've learned over the years. Now, we've gone out to make money, but we decided she was going to stay home and raise the kids instead of going out working to make more money. And that was just a choice we made. Some things that we prayed about and decided what to do. But, you know, you work out your own lifestyle once you get saved, how you live it. And God, you know, asking to help you to make those decisions. Solomon made a lot of decisions or made gained a lot of knowledge by the way that he looked at things and it's to help you and I today in making those decisions when we go to make decisions the best way to source is that Bible right there is looking in there and seeing what God wants us to do Solomon he's given us such a blueprint here of how not to be miserable but yet the world points and says, you've got to go out and make all the money you can. And we want to make money because we want to have other things. But we get our perspectives messed up with gifts versus entitlements. Now, have you heard that word, entitlement? 
that's owed to me. And there's a lot of that going around. You know, even in the Christian community, that's owed to me. What's owed to you? Yeah. Nothing. Exactly. Nothing's owed to you. And if we can get our minds off of what we think we're owed and then start looking at it as it's a gift from God, it could be through another person, but it's a gift, and treat it as a gift to be thankful for it, <coughs> how much happier can you be? If you're looking for all your entitlements and, entitlements and demanding them, you're never going to be satisfied. It, it's, it's easy to sit here and look at things and analyze it and come up with a solution, but then when the rubber hits the road, that's a whole other story. Okay? Wes? <laughs> There's a couple things that I wish I'd have taken at heart when I talked to my granddaddy years and years ago. The thing was to me, you give the first 10% you earn to the floor, you take the next 10% and put it in savings, and the, from that point on, you're going to always have yep. some money, and you're going to always be in good graces with the Lord. Yeah. And the other thing was, he, he has, and I got a bit, his written thing on, on the wall, it's not how much you earn, but how much you give of what you earn. Yeah, yeah. And he lived by both of those things. He, he never went to school, but he ended up a right wealthy man. Yeah, very wise, yeah. very wise. And that's basically what we did. That's how we kind of started off. First 10% went to God. Yeah. Then we tried to save 10% and lived on the rest of it. And, uh, you know, back making $800 a month, it wasn't a whole lot to go around back in those days, you know, but. That was my first job. Huh? I said that was my first job was seven seventy five a month. I thought I was the richest guy in the yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> a lot better than passing papers, wasn't it? Yeah, I started yeah. Duke at 85 cents an hour. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. But. I was rich. Uh, <laughs> Solomon went through a lot of different things to give us a lot of good information here. Now, let's not squander what Solomon's uncovered. Because if we go on down, you know, he says, I I'm doing all this stuff and then I have no control after I die because there is the great equalizer, death. A rich man will die, a poor man will die. That's the great equalizer. And once you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> you know, that's it. It's over. Game done. You know, game clock went off. You're done. And Solomon said, so therefore, then it doesn't matter all that I've done because I, I don't have any control over that anymore. That bothered him. It really worried him. And it, to me, that's going to make you miserable worrying about that stuff. And he goes on, let me go over here to the next verse because I thought this was interesting. Here he says, For what hath man of all his labors and of the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief, yet his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. What that hit me was, you can't sleep because you're worrying over stuff. Now, folks, that's a sad thing to do. Not be able to sleep because you're worrying over stuff. You know, that's where I go back to my old buddy, Alfred E. Newman, Mad <clears throat> Magazine's motto, What Me Worry. We don't need to worry. Now, we can be concerned, and certain things creep up on us and kind of catch us a little bit off guard, but then we go to God and say, God, handle it. I'm trusting you take care of it. I belong to you. Whatever you want, that's okay. Can we get to that place where we say, God, I'm yours. Whatever you want, I accept that. Now you, you analyze that to all the different routes that can take and make sure you say, I'm okay with that. Because some of those routes could be a, a tough road to hoe, so to speak. But if you belong to God and you're trusting God and you've given yourself to him, then be okay with what he says and how he directs you. Solomon just said, you know, I would wake up at night and I couldn't sleep worrying over this stuff. Well, what's that going to do to your body if you can't sleep? 
That, it's going to wear you down, and that can hasten your death. We're not designed to worry, folks. Worry will kill you. It'll really kill you. And we're not designed to handle that worry. We're designed to give it to God and let God take care of it. Okay. Therefore, there is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten here unto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail together and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. The direct reference to God in, Ecclesiast in the Ecclesiastes is few and far between. But here we have a direct reference to God right here. It says, he is the giver of joy. He come to that realization. If we understand that divine gifts of creation are meant to be enjoyed as a matter of stewardship rather than as possessions, we see that they have their, <coughs> their limits. So it's accepting what God has given us. Now, that's not to say that when you have a job, you do it to your best of your ability. What happens when you take a job and you do it to the best of your ability? A lot of times you get promoted, don't you? You enjoy it. Well, you enjoy it. Yes, exactly. And that's what, that's what God's asking us to do. You take the job that you've got, do it to the best of your ability, and it's like you can say to yourself, I'm going to do this Today, uh, as unto God. I wasn't here for prayer requests, but my step-granddaughter had surgery operation, and she lost her toe, and oh. she's covering on both feet. So. Okay, what's her name? Uh, Madison. Madison. Okay, thanks, Chip. His step-granddaughter had some surgery and lost uh, a toe and I had to take it off and it's kind of embarrassing her. Her name's Madison, so he wants us to remember her in prayer. So, but, so, you know, God says that, uh, you know, we cannot look to the gifts. Uh, I can't read. I can't see up here. We cannot look to the gifts to give us what can only come from the giver himself. So, when we look at the gifts that God gives us, instead of <coughs> relishing in the gifts, we need to relish in the giver of the gifts. And this goes back, Patty, to what you and I have been talking about, is living our life in conversation to God. And Patty and I have been looking at this from a guy named Brother Lawrence to kind of get us in this mindset of always being in conversation with God and being thankful for what he's given us, no matter where our lot in life is. It's like Mike said earlier, which made a lot of sense, and it's true, the, having money is not evil in itself. It's the love of money. When that's our sole factor in chasing that money to gain more. And, you know, how much is enough? You know, we talked about Jeff Bezos. I believe that's the richest man in the world. They, I know they kind of go back. Well, maybe not the world, but at least in the U.S. You know, how much is, is enough? A little bit more. It's never enough, is it? <laughs> you know, and like we said, you can't take it with you. It's a challenge. It's a game to these folks just to make more and more and more. Well, you know, when you start looking and coming to the end of your life, you start making provisions for, you know, your retirement and everything else. Um, one of the important factors is to keep in mind that some of that money you've amassed for your retirement is that you use it for good to help others. And I think that'll give you a fulfillment as working will is being able to help and to feel, fulfill other people that are maybe not as fortunate. You know, God's blessed us abundantly. And, you know, we need to be mindful of that fact. Because remember, you can't take it with you. Somebody else is going to get it. And it might not be who you thought should get it. So we make plans while we're here. We look to the giver of gifts and we praise him. It's God. 
And we know that once we live this life, it doesn't matter. We're going to be in a much, much better place with Jesus. All right, let's pray. Father, again, we want to thank you for another day you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the lesson. We thank you for our Bibles that you've given us as a love letter to us to help us to know who you are and what you expect. And you've given us a blueprint for life. For all decisions, we can go there and gain help and gain knowledge. We thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that whatever need might be present, that you would meet it. We lift up Madison to you, Lord, that you would comfort her. We also lift up those in our body that are in need right now, that are hurting, that need healing, that need direction, that you would just meet those needs, Father. And now we ask that you go with us to the next hour, that you would speak to us from our pastor the words that we need to hear. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen. amen.